It really is a great pleasure uh, and a delight to welcome uh, Dr. Nicholas Maragakis for the keynote presentation. Uh, Dr. Maragakis is uh, a neurology professor at John Hopkins, where he directs the um, clinical trials unit there. He's also the director of the ALS Center. Um, Dr. Maragakis has been fighting this uh, long fight against ALS for a long time. Um, he's made significant contributions. Um, a long time ago, he pioneered some of the some of the first uh, models that showcase flagged actually um, glutamate excitotoxicity as a major mechanism of modern neuron degeneration. This was some of the um, first evidence that supported, that facilitated the um, approval of Riluzole as a treatment for ALS. Um, he um, um, continues, has been and continues to be involved in running many clinical trials through NEILS and at Hopkins. Uh, he also, he, he, he continues to see and treat patients. And I know for a fact, because once he um, um, saw a uh, NLS patient that was uh, a family friend that his patients love him. Um, and he also runs a very high level research lab. Um, he uh, works around many different aspects of ALS research. He continues to have a strong interest in astrocytic uh, biology and astrocytic um, toxicity. And, um, you know, I've known uh, Nicholas for a number of years. I first met him when I was a postdoctoral fellow at the uh, Project ALS, P2 ALS meetings, whatever they were called back then. Back then, and I guess I um, I can attest to his generosity. I think he always made time to speak to young grad students and postdoctoral fellows like myself. And uh, I, you know, I'm delighted that he's here today. Um, I I can't think of a more appropriate keynote speaker for this uh, venue, which is geared towards both the patient population and the basic research scientists. So. Um, Welcome to Northwestern again, and thank you. Uh, thanks for the very kind introduction. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be able to speak with you today uh, to the Les Turner Foundation, to Northwestern University. It's great being back amongst friends, and I will say to patients, you are um, extremely lucky to have a, <clears throat> a very talented and caring group of physicians, um, but also I think Northwestern has really beautifully grown its um, scientific expertise as well. And so it, it's, it's, it's great to come back. I was here a number of years ago to give a talk and, and so I'm honored to be back and I'm, I'm happy to, to be able to share some of the work we're, be, we're doing, but also I guess going last can be either good or bad. You know. I, Sometimes someone stole my thunder, but then at the same time, I think some of the things I want to touch on today, I'll draw from, from some of my colleagues, including you know mouse modeling and, and so forth. So um, what I really want to talk about is um, induced pluripotent stem cells, how we're using them in the laboratory, but also as a community, how we're using them, how we might think about translating, or at least how our lab um, thought about potential use of these cells for translation um, into clinical trials. These are my disclosures. You saw this slide already, and I, I bring it up to really um, drive home the idea that the vast majority of, of patients obviously have what we would consider a sporadic <coughs> ALS, with an important subset of patients having familial disease. And you saw that this morning, as, as Kat Lutz talked about, number of mouse models that are being developed with some of these familial mutations that can teach us something uh, very much about the disease. Importantly, about 7% of sporadic patients also have this very common um, mutation that Evangelos Kiskinis pointed out, the C9 mutation, and, and um, uh, that was touched on also um, by others. The second thing I want to drive home, and we've been very interested in the relationship between motor neuron cell death, and we call this a motor neuron disease, but in fact, we know from the work of others um, that other cell types are critically important as well. And so our laboratory is very interested in, uh, in astrocytes, but also there are data to suggest their oligodendrocyte involvement, microglial cell involvement, even endothelial cells may also play a role. 
maybe not in disease initiation, but actually in disease progression. And I think that's particularly exciting because it offers us additional uh, potential uh, targets for therapeutics. And so that's one of the things we will, um, I'll, I'll stress today. This is, a, to me, a kind of intimidating slide. And in a way, I'll, I'll, I'll readdress it at the end, but you can see there are a lot of relevant or potentially relevant pathways. A lot of these have specific mutations in specific genes that cause axonopathies or cause changes in autophagy and so forth. While intimidating on one hand to suggest there's so much heterogeneity in the, in the cause of the disease, again, at the same time, I think it's exciting because I'm going to show you a slide where there are a number of drugs that are being, um, that are targeting almost every one of these pathways. So when I go to the clinic, I have some observations. So as a general rule, why does weakness in ALS have a distinct anatomical spread? I can tell a patient if he or she develops foot drop that that leg is likely to get weaker before let's say they develop speech or swallowing problems. Why do some ALS patients have slow progression on the order of years or decades and others progress more rapidly? Why do some patients present, as Dr. Osdenler pointed out with such upper motor neuron predominant pathology and, and Dr. Piora is doing beautiful imaging along those lines to show the upper motor neuron relevant phenomenon that we sometimes take for granted, but clearly relevant and some patients have only or primarily lower motor neuron disease. Why do some patients have bulbar onset ALS and some have spinal onset? Why are certain cell populations spared? You know, oculomotor dysfunction only occurs very, very, very late. And primarily, I've only seen it in patients who are on ventilators. So oculomotor um, nerves and muscles are spared and autonomic function for the most part is spared. And then of course, we no longer think about ALS just as a neuromuscular disease or as a motor neuron disease, but truly a neurodegenerative disease. And through the discovery of the CNA North 72 mutation and, and subsequent clinical um, characterizations and now other genes, we really do think about ALS as a neurodegenerative disease rather than just a motor neuron disease. So a lot of complexity, but these are some of the things I think about that we can learn from our patients. So this was this is the SOD1 um, mouse model. Uh, and, and, and Kat pointed out earlier that it really does represent a very small fraction of the disease. Nevertheless, I do think it's an important model. But if there's such phenotypic heterogeneity in ALS, are all mechanisms of neuron or motor neuron degeneration similar, or do we have other opportunities to leverage other strategies? And so in my laboratory and the laboratory of many others, including those here at Northwestern, can we use human iPS cell derived neural cells? Those can be motor neurons, those could be astrocytes, microglia, other cell types to address some of this heterogeneity in the disease. So what is, a, what is an induced pluripotent stem cell? I, um, I don't wanna take it for granted because I know we have a diverse audience here, but the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine was um, won in 2012 by, um, uh, by Yamanaka and colleagues because they developed induced pluripotent stem cells from mouse embryonic and adult fibroblasts through a variety of strategies. So, you know, essentially for, for our audience here, this is the, now the ability to work back from the clinic, if you will, and that is to see a patient, a patient with ALS, but it could be other, any disease, to isolate somatic cells. These could be blood cells, these could be skin fibroblasts, to then reprogram them with a mixture of three or four different genes. And there are a lot of different strategies now for reprogramming and to make this IP, these IPS cells. And through a number of different differentiation strategies, they can now become a number of different, really any kind of cell type in the body. But of course, our interest is in neural stem cells, uh, that is being neurons and, and, and cells in, in our case for, of the central nervous system. So this, I always find this striking because oftentimes people win the Nobel Prize decades after their discovery. But this was, I think, speaks to the importance of this discovery. Between 2006, with these initial publications, to winning the Nobel Prize six years later, I think speaks to the importance and how this has really changed medicine. So as we think about ALS, I told you there are different cell types involved. But again, we've heard about upper and lower motor neuron involvement. It is corticospinal and spinal motor neurons. So the upper motor neurons that die are, are, are BET cells or in the motor cortex. The, the descending pathways, the cortical bulbar, cortical spinal tract pathways are subsequently involved and degenerate. 
And at the same time, lower motor neurons, that is those cells that go from the spinal cord out to the muscle, also degenerate both in the, in the brain stem that can cause speech and swallowing problems, but also the spinal nerve roots. And those are oftentimes the things that we associate most with ALS because they're the most visually obvious with muscle atrophy or maybe muscle fasciculations. So in our lab and the lab of many others, we've been able to use human iPS cells to differentiate or use a, a variety of different differentiation strategies to develop spinal cord patterning, which you can see on the left. And we use a number of different factors to either generate spinal motor neurons, or we're also very interested in generating spinal cord specific astrocytes. So spinal cord specific astrocytes. And at the same time, our labs our lab is also generating corticospinal motor neurons that have very specific markers, but we're also, because we're an astrocyte lab as well, believe we now have some techniques to generate astrocytes from the cortex too. And that's something I think that's been a little underappreciated is the role of regional specificity and how that might influence disease. So spinal motor neurons and spinal astrocytes is an example, cortical spinal motor neurons and cortical, and cortical astrocytes allow us, I think, a lot of potential for discovery and to address some of these issues with regard to heterogeneity. So what does this look like in, in practice? So on the left, you see three individuals. From here on out, all the orange is gonna be people with sporadic ALS, green will be people with familial ALS, and controls will be in gray. And we can now take PBMCs, um, peripheral blood monocytes, from those patients, put them into a house here. It's, this is a house. This is the extent of my knowledge of reprogramming these cells. And they come out as iPS cells. And you can see that we can make them in our laboratory into both astrocytes uh, up on the top or motor neurons, either from control patients, familial ALS uh, uh, patients, or patients with sporadic disease. And in fact, we can grow them together. We can grow them in cold culture next to each other, which you can see um, in, these, uh, in these round dishes. So we can grow them with connections to each other, or we can grow them on separate layers. And why, can, why is that important to us? Because now we believe we can tease out, if we can separate those cells from each other, we can now ask questions about what is diffusing from one cell to another in a non-contact relationship. And I'll show you why that's important. We're also very interested to Dr. Osdenler's work that was beautifully demonstrating that corticospinal and spinal motor neurons, can we use those same techniques in our laboratory to essentially generate a corticospinal tract or, a cortic or essentially reproduce much of what we see in the brain and spinal cord um, on a chip or on a dish? And in the far right, you're seeing um, uh, a magnified image of, of these little multi-electrode array electrodes that we can record from groups of cells. So we can recapitulate then these ALS relevant pathways, everything from the cortical from the cortical neurons to the spinal uh, to the spinal neurons, and that and then we're also we and others are actually using techniques to allow us to specifically activate subgroups of cells by introducing um, other genes like channel rhodopsins that allow us to stimulate individual populations of cells and then subsequently record from them. So I hope this gives you at least a perspective of some of the opportunities and uh, uh, that that these stem cells um, offer. So what kinds of things might we look at with regard to spinal, um, spinal motor neurons? We can look at ALS specific pathology. You heard a lot about TDP43 mislocalization and nucleocytoplasmic differences amongst these cells. We can record from them electrophysiologically. We can ask, we can stress them. So we can ask, do ALS motor neurons have different vulnerabilities to cell stress? We can mix them together, astrocytes and motor neurons. And of course, our goal and the goal of others is to actually do drug screening with these cell types as well. To ask, is a, is a drug that affects one cell type, let's say um, a, a Stathman II relevant pathway in one patient population, is that relevant to other patient populations as well? And so this isn't fantasy. This is not something that you know, I hope we can do someday. This is really work that is actually going on. I, mean, I share these two slides almost uniformly because it's really beautiful work. And in fact, Evangelos Kiskinis was a, a co-first author on this paper, but that was the demonstration using iPS cells from patients or from a couple of patients with an SOD1 mutation to in fact show electrophysiologically the patient, um, the patient, um, who has ALS is noted here in, in red and the, and the control, a healthy control is, is noted here in black. And what I hope you can appreciate 
These are electrophysiological recordings of a neuron firing. What I hope you can appreciate is those cells in red are firing much more um, actively. And so suggesting that these were uh, these cells, these motor neurons from ALS patients were in fact hyperexcitable. And this group actually went on to say, well, that's fine. Are there potential drugs that might reduce that hyperexcitability? And so they used this drug called ritigabine, also known as azogabine, and clinically and um, commercially known as Potiga, which was an anti-epilepsy drug and was actually on the market. And they were able to activate potassium channels and showed they could quiet those cells down. So this was in an IPS cell. This was a discovery in an IPS cell and a drug screen. And so this study, this went then to, to clinical trial, not so much for its efficacy, but to ask, could, what, could the phenomenon we saw in IPS cells also be present in ALS patients? And it, so using a variety of different electrophysiological studies in people with ALS, we, and I'm gonna say we, cause it was, a, it was actually a consortium of, of of groups that did this, were able to show that in fact, ALS patients had some of these same hyperexcitable phenomenon. And in fact, when patients were given this drug in a blinded fashion, a really very nice, albeit small study of like a little over 50 patients, I believe, that in fact, this drug was able to quiet down the electrophysiological properties of inpatients. And so um, for a variety of reasons, azogabine is not currently um, on the market, but there is a group um, a company, in fact, that is developing other potassium channel agonists with these same ideas in mind. So this is really something I hope you'll appreciate is really palpable that, that what's happening in the laboratory really can get to the clinic. So we've been very interested in our laboratory about astrocytes and astrocyte biology and how they might contribute to, to motor neuron death and ALS pathogenesis. And I showed you this picture before. This is just, again, a reminder that we're very interested in this astrocyte motor neuron connection. When I see patients, they've already developed ALS. They might already have hand weakness or arm weakness or leg weakness. <coughs> and there's a hypothesis that, that the disease may start in one region and subsequently spread to other regions. You can see this uh, demonstrated in red and, and yellow. But the disease begins in one spot and, and then, and then um, evolves to involve other anatomical regions. And this very, very well might account for the the anatomical progression we see from one part of the limb to the other. And it's my belief, and I think through the work of our, our work and others, that astrocytes play a key role in disease progression after onset. So I believe that neurons are probably the genesis of at least the initial ALS dysfunction, but other cell types like astrocytes and microglia and potentially oligodendrocytes probably play a role in disease progression. This is relevant for those of you who are, who are clinicians or when you're seeing a patient in the clinic, because again, disease has already started. So these could be relevant targets for the way we think about things. So my laboratory was very interested in astrocytes and astrocyte biology that are very rich in gap junctions and hemichannels. So these, um, these gap junctions are channels that form intercellular communication between two cells. It's how astrocytes talk to each other, for example. They're composed of two hemichannels one on each side of the membrane. So you can see there would be one here and a hemichannel on the other side. And these gap junctions and hemichannels allow diffusion of small, small molecules, ions, metabolites like glucose, glutamate, lactate, second messengers like calcium, ATP, uh, and others, and even microRNAs uh, most recently. And they can either exist in an open state where those um, second messengers or ions flow from one cell to another or from the cytoplasm to the extracellular space, or they can exist in a closed space. And in a story I won't tell you today, because that's essentially uh, ongoing work, we're very interested in understanding what opens and closes those, um, those channels, particularly in the context of ALS. So we, we saw that these um, astrocytes were enriched in these, uh, in these connexins to form either gap junctions or hemichannels. And connexin 43 is the most prominent subtype of um, of these channels. So it's the predominant astrocyte connection in the central nervous system. And these connexins, these proteins and their gap junctions and hemichannels synchronize astrocyte networks, provide metabolic support for neurons, regulate vascular um, components that is part of the blood brain barrier. They modulate synaptic events. They're part of the tripartite synapse. They modulate calcium waves through the release of 
gliotransmitters through these hemichannels. And they're very involved developmentally through synaptic plasticity and activity. And so this is an example of a channel. And you can see that there would be um, ATP is an example here, but a, a lot of ions and, and uh, small molecules can move through these um, hemichannels. So uh, a number of individuals in my lab asked the following question. Um, could the upregulation of connexin 43 and astrocytes contribute to motor neuron death or neuroprotection? So we started with human tissue. We wanted to be relevant. We wanted this to be relevant for patients if in fact we found something. And in fact, when we looked in human tissue, just at protein levels in ALS patients in the motor cortex on the top, the cervical spinal cord and the lumbar spinal cord, I think you can appreciate, and this is seen visually, that there's a pretty significant upregulation in, in the, this connexin 43 protein in ALS patients. Well, that was great, but could we then use something in vivo? And we turned to the SOD1 mouse model and we used it because it has motor neuron degeneration. We know it has a prominent astrocyte response and asked whether this was something we could use uh, downstream as a model. And in fact, much like we might've predicted from human ALS tissues, in this mouse model of ALS, we also saw upregulation of this particular protein. And then we took a human iPS cells. So now these are iPS cells from patients and asked the same question. Would there be uh, an increase in this protein um, from ALS patients? And the answer was yes. We looked at patients with sporadic disease as well as uh, with uh, several different familial um, phenotypes or genotypes. So we now had evidence in patients, we had evidence in ALS mouse models, and now we had the opportunity to look in vitro because we could demonstrate this with, um, uh, with iPS cells from these patients. So can we use then human tissues, animal models, human iPS cells to more accurately predict disease processes in patients with ALS and improve our success with targeted therapeutics? It was brought up earlier that a lot of drugs we've tried have been studied in an SOD1 mouse model and the vast, vast, vast majority are, have failed. So are there opportunities to use these different strategies to make us, um, give us a better chance of predicting success? We started by asking the following question, much as I showed you before we went back to ALS patients, we did a larger cohort. We just didn't want to demonstrate this in a handful of patients, but many more patients. And in fact, showed that in the motor cortex of ALS patients, as well as the cervical spinal cord, in fact, again, these proteins were upregulated. We then looked in the cerebrospinal fluid to ask, you know, it's, it's hard, obviously, uh, I don't mean to be facetious to do a, a brain or a spinal cord biopsy on a patient, but we can measure cerebrospinal fluid. And so we said in ALS patients, do they have higher levels of these proteins? And in fact, we're able to demonstrate in the cerebrospinal fluid that ALS patients have higher levels of this connexin 43 protein. And then again, as I showed you, we went, we went and did this in a number of astrocyte um, subtypes from patients with the disease. So we didn't, again, want to do this just a couple of patients, but a lot of patients. And this is an example here on the upper right-hand corner of all the cell lines we used. And I hope now you can see the potential um, power of the strategy. So I think I see six control lines. We looked at patients with slow sporadic, slowly progressing sporadic disease, typical, what I call typical progression, rapid progression, we looked at patients with the A4V SOD1 mutation, a very rapidly progressing form of the disease. So we looked at all, the, all of these different cell lines. And much like I had showed you before, we used this, what I'll call a mix and match strategy to look at astrocytes and motor neurons, astrocytes from diseased patients, from patients harboring disease with uh, regular motor neurons. And we can count cells and we can do electrophysiology on these cell subtypes. So I showed you before, we started with a very specific protocol to allow us um, the capacity for making spinal cord astrocytes and spinal cord motor neurons as well. We wanted to be as regionally specific uh, as possible. So this is a busy slide, but I'm just going to um, just give you the, the, bot the bottom line. We looked, um, everything in white here are, um, these are control cells. And we looked at the number of motor neurons in a dish. So we looked at astrocytes. We took astrocytes from patients with ALS and we mixed them with normal motor neurons and asked the question like other, um, like some of our colleagues in the field have done, do astrocytes 
from ALS patients kill motor neurons? And the answer is yes. Everything in green here, you'll see are patients with familial ALS and those in um, orange are patients with sporadic disease. So the number of motor neurons was reduced when challenged with um, ALS astrocytes. And we could do this both in a mix and match strategy where those cells were touching, but also we could separate those cells in two different layers and found that same um, toxicity. And you can see that there's a dramatic loss of motor neurons um, in the groups, both with familial disease and sporadic disease, suggesting to us that the phenomenon of toxicity was something in, uh, secreted or excreted or diffused into the surrounding space. And we could rescue that. We could rescue that, um, that toxicity. And those are the columns on the right here in dark green or dark orange. So we could rescue that uh, toxicity by blocking um, specifically those connects and hemichannels. So this is a small peptide called GAP19. It blocks these channels. And we could show both with these direct connections, as well as when we separate these cells, that we could get motor neuron protection by blocking connexin 43 hemichannels, right? So blocking connexin 43 hemichannels. Well, that's great, but peptides don't cross the blood-brain barrier very effectively. And in fact, we would have had to deliver high doses of these mimetic peptides to get blockade of hemichannels. So really for our purposes, not, it's not a practical translational opportunity. So we said, are there translation, are there drugs or small molecules out there that may be beneficial? So we actually looked in the literature and it turns out a number of years ago, there was a drug called tenabrasat, and tenabrasat was studied in migraine. And the rationale was that it is known that gap junctions and hemichannels play a role in something called cortical spreading depression. And it's thought to be a mechanism behind why migraine occurs. And that this drug, through a screen that I won't um, belabor, but looking for migraine agents, was came to the top. So this was studied several, in several different um, placebo-controlled studies. It's delivered orally once a day, so it gets into the central nervous system. 199 patients were enrolled in two studies for migraine prophylaxis and 859 patients in two additional studies for acute migraine. So there was no effect on migraine frequency, but the belief was that this could be um, an effect of delayed absorption of the compound. So you know, when you get a migraine, you'd like relief quickly but there was no, there was no um, beneficial effect. But there was a reduction in migraine aura thought to be linked to this idea about spreading depression. And importantly, if you're gonna think about how you might take this from the laboratory and put it into the clinic, it was considered safe and well tolerated. So I wanna show you some of the work we did with this drug. And the first thing is to show you some of the versatility. Can we look at how this drug <clears throat> acts in real time? So these are called multi-electrode arrays, a way, a way of recording electrophysiologically from groups of IPS motor neurons. And if I can get this to play. Uh, let's see here. Let's go to the visible arrow, here we go. So what you can appreciate, I hope here, the higher the spike, the more electrophysiological activity there is. So on the left, you'll see before we give this drug to Nabrasat, and afterwards, you'll see that we can reduce motor neuron activity, hyperexcitability by the addition of, by the addition of this drug. So what happens then if we then do the same thing? We took astrocytes from ALS patients, mix them with wild type or control motor neurons and ask, could this drug in a dose dependent fashion actually rescue cells? And I think you can see here, there's no drug here, one micromolar, <coughs> 10 micromolar, we see a very nice rescue. And important to this idea of how you might test a drug at hundred micromolar was actually toxic. So it, there, there seems to be a sweet spot for this drug. And it seems to act both in this mixed culture as well as these separated um, cultures as well. So great, we have an in vitro model, we have a new drug, we can show that it's efficacious in vitro and, and uh, Kat brought up why do it in mice? <clears throat> so I'll tell you why we did it in mice. Not because of the SOD1 mutation or that SOD1 was particularly our targets, but specifically with the idea of looking at um, 
how this might be dosed in a mammalian model. So we did it two ways. We started dosing at 40 days of age, pre-symptomatically, before um, mice developed disease. And we looked at these mice at 100 days of age, that is during the middle of their disease, or we looked at them at end stage. And the, oh, this laser pointer doesn't give me the, hang on. There we go. So one of the reasons we wanted to, Um, so one of the things we wanted to know was if we administered this drug, would it change the protein level of these hemichannels? And the answer to that is no. It seems to be acting at the channel. It's not working as an antisense oligonucleotide where we're depressing the level of this connexin protein. All we're doing is blocking that um, channel very specifically. And so when we look then at 100 days of age, during the symptomatic phase, we didn't see motor neuron protection. So we did not see motor neuron protection during the symptomatic phase. But if we looked in that 30-day window between 100, 100 days, let's say, and 130 days, we saw very nice motor neuron protection, which I think goes along with our hypothesis that this drug is probably acting after disease onset. It's probably acting when astrocytes get hot, they upregulate this protein, and they release factors that subsequently accelerate disease progression. We then asked the question, what happens if you administer it at the time of symptom onset? And um, this is tricky, and I'll tell you why it's tricky, because this is a very aggressive disease. But what we did find was that while we didn't see big changes with regard to animal survival, what we did see, at least in the cervical spinal cord, was a modest neuroprotective uh, effect. So not as robust as delivering it pre-symptomatically or early during symptom um, onset but at least showed some uh, evidence that there was a neuroprotective uh, effect. So this is what I think is going on in the context of this particular um, protein. If something bad happens, something goes from green to red, something bad happens in the motor cortex and the ventral horn of the spinal cord, and subsequently microglia are activated and they release cytokines and chemokines. And when they do that, they make astrocytes hot, they make them reactive. And then through those hemichannels, here in the black circles, you can see that something is released, and that's what we're working on currently, to either act on motor neurons or to feed back and activate microglia further. So it's a feed forward loop where we're activating microglia and reactivating microglia through this loop. And finally, <coughs> astrocytes secrete cytokines and chemokines as well that subsequently kill motor neurons. So this is our working hypothesis. And we're currently very interested in what these factors, if you will, are that are released from these hemichannels. And it may be that there's not just one, but there may very well may be many. So this is my summary slide for this, um, <coughs> this section that connexin 43 is increased in human ALS and mouse models in a regionally specific manner. And it's recapitulated in these iPS cell derived astrocytes, both in sporadic disease and familial disease. The connexin 43 hemichannel localization is increased in ALS. <coughs> I didn't show you those data in detail. That motor neuron toxicity by these ALS astrocytes appears to be connexin 43 hemichannel mediated, and that's demonstrated by our use of these very specific hemichannel blockers. That this does not appear to be specific to motor neurons. I didn't show you these data for the sake of time, but other neuronal subtypes are probably affected as well. And the tenabrasat, this small molecule with known CNS penetrability, with a good safety profile, blocks these hemichannels. And we can measure this electrophysiologically as well as pathologically, and is dose-dependently neuroprotective. <clears throat> and finally, chronic treatment of these ALS mice with this drug can provide neuroprotection during the symptomatic phase of disease. Oh yeah, and we can measure it in the CSF, and it's a biomarker. <coughs> So let me take a pause here and just mention in one slide that this is not done in um, isolation. This isn't just about my lab or someone else's lab, but this is part of a much larger program called the Answer ALS program <clears throat> that has leveraged a thousand patients. Um, we've, uh, patients have been uh, kind enough to undergo clinical examinations over time. We've done um, genomics on uh, patients, including whole genome sequencing. We've sent PBMCs to Cedar sinai to make iPS cells. 
and we've banked um, biomarkers, blood and serum and CSF for future analysis. And these uh, data and samples are available to the entire um, ALS uh, community. In fact, I'll point out the Northwestern was one of the sites, one of the uh, eight sites in the US that participated in this study. I was asked by Dr. Osdenler just to touch briefly, because I know we're going to discuss this, um, but just to touch on a couple of issues relevant to current patient care. And that is, within the last six months, we've had new, two new drugs developed, um, or approved, I should say. One is Adarivone, also known as Radicava. Uh, it's an antioxidant-free radical scavenger, first designed as a therapy for acute stroke. And a subpopulation of these patients, of, of ALS patients, seem to respond in particular over a six-month period to this drug. The reasons are not entirely well known, but it represents about a 33% slowing of disease progression. It's administered orally in cycles over um, a, a, essentially two weeks out of the month. And it's pretty well tolerated with headache, bruising, and gait problems being some side effects. It's, it's an expensive drug, as you can see, without um, insurance approval. It was originally formulated intravenously, but as the oral form became available in May of this year. <clears throat> and I'll touch on this because this drug um, called AMX035, also known as, we heard about sodium phenylbutyrate earlier from Bob Kolb's um, really nice uh, talk on uh, metabolism as it relates to ALS. So this combination of sodium phenylbutyrate and Tutka here in the States, the drug is called Relivrio, was approved um, by the FDA at the end of September 29th specifically. And it probably acts through mitochondrial and endoplasmic reticulum relevant pathways. It's administered orally, it's expensive drug without insurance coverage. And there's probably some GI upset initially, which seems to abate over time. This was studied in a trial called the CENTAR trial. And the CENTAR trial studied this particular compound, AMX035. And it, over a six month period, it was shown that this drug was able to slow disease progression using this scale called the ALS functional rating scale. And patients who received placebo over this six month period declined at a rate of 1.6 um, points per month compared to those who received drug uh, and they declined only by 1.24 points per month. And this is demonstrated graphically here. But more importantly, I think potentially, I won't speak for the FDA, but I, I think was relevant to its approval was in fact, when they looked at patients who were on this drug for a long period of time, there was probably a survival benefit as well. This was a, an ongoing analysis, which showed a survival in patients who received this drug from the very get-go compared to patients who had received placebo during that first six month period. This drug continues to be studied. It's an interesting mechanism of action. Um, and so uh, it, it has been approved. And I think stay tuned to see how widely um, effective uh, this compound is. I want to show you this slide because it really um, makes me hopeful and enthusiastic for what's coming down the pike. You can see the number of clinical trials for ALS has really blossomed over the last 10 years. These are company, institution, and government funded clinical trials. And in fact, I'll tell Patients who might be listening today, there are phase one, two, and three trials now recruiting participants with ALS. There are broad spectrum of ALS pathways now being targeted. The emphasis has gone from long-term studies, one year or two years, to relatively short double-blind studies followed by open label extension periods. Now more than ever, we've um, uh, asked people with ALS um, to participate in clinical trial design. And I think that's been very helpful to know what's important, obviously, to, to our patient population. I also think we're, we're, we're starting to see a trend towards stratifying patients by genetic background, disease severity, or how they progress. And, and, and those are going to be incorporated into uh, studies. And, and exploratory biomarkers, I showed you how we've been thinking about it as we're designing a new compound but there are biomarkers being designed and being implemented to try to um, recruit patients to the, most appropriate, um, to the most appropriate study. So where do I think the field, if I can, um, is going? Number one, develop better mo animal models of ALS that can aid in the study of novel therapeutics. Invest in the development of better biomarkers for understanding disease progression. Define the clinical and genetic subtypes of disease to allow stratification to patients. We want patients in the right trials. 
and expand, of course, the therapeutic landscape. So there are now a variety of animal models, speaking to this, that may aid in our understanding <laughs> of ALS. We heard about the SOD1 mouse in the top left-hand corner, but there are now worm models of ALS, fruit fly models of ALS, zebra fish models, I showed you cell culture models, and even yeast are being <laughs> used to screen drugs, um, screen drugs and identify pathways relevant to the disease. <clears throat> I showed you the potential for iPS cells and how they might allow us to address the heterogeneity of this disease. And biomarkers, you heard Eric Pior talk about imaging biomarkers and Bob Kolb talked about potential for some of these metabolomic or metabolic rele metabolically relevant biomarkers. So those can be biofluid biomarkers in the blood or the serum. They can be tissue samples that could be biomarkers, urine, skin, I'm, I'm not just, I didn't just throw out every, these are actually either happening or people have actually looked. Um, muscle biopsies, there are easier ways now to take muscle biopsies. Electrophysiologically, I showed you how looking at hyperexcitability in patient populations with ALS actually have demonstrated um, a potential efficacy of azogabine or ritigabine. Pet imaging or other imaging strategies, all used as biomarkers, and finally things like cerebrospinal fluid. So this is a very active um, line of investigation. Hopefully, at least from my laboratory, what I was able to show you gives you an idea about how we've thought about it. This was a slide that was um, shown earlier about the uh, amazing uh, rapidity with which we've been able to we. I, don't, I know nothing about genetics, so it's actually so not me, but we as a community have discovered genes that are relevant to ALS. Why is that relevant? Some of these are incredibly rare mutations, maybe only occurring in one or two families. But as you saw earlier with KIF5A as an example, these can teach us something about the disease as whole and give us new therapeutic targets. And, and I showed this slide, I wanted to come back kind of full circle to show you, I showed that very complicated slide at the beginning with all of these different pathways, right? Motor neuron pathways, astrocyte pathways, but everything I've circled here, these are drugs in clinical trial, um, either currently or, uh, or, or um, I think actually everything here is current. So these are every one of these pathways. And so in some cases, there are more than one um, drug being targeting these pathways are currently being studied in the context of ALS, including, um, including muscle. So that gives me hope that the more we learn about mechanisms of disease and the tools that we use for mechanisms to, of disease can really um, get our pharma um, colleagues excited about, about targeting some of these efforts. So this work really represents um, the majority of the story I told you today are, are, are people um, in, in my laboratory who, dr who drove these efforts who are listed in the upper left-hand corner. I have a number of collaborators who've helped uh, to push these efforts along, iPS cell biologists and other collaborators. Um, and of course, this doesn't happen without the participation of people with ALS and their generosity in helping us to try to learn more about the disease. We have an active clinical trials unit and of course, a, an active clinic. So I, I will stop there. Um, thank you for your time. Hopefully that was... Um, uh, Hopefully I was able to offer some insights. Thanks again. Great, um, thank you so much, Nick. So uh, questions? Yeah. One, you have one? <laughs> Hi, Nick. Why do you think the astrocytes need to be connected to each other to elaborate this toxic entity? So, um, I'm sorry, maybe I'm, so the, I, I don't think they do actually. So if we separate them in two different layers, that is we grow astrocytes on a nitrocellulose membrane and grow motor neurons below that, we still, we still establish that same degree of toxicity. Well, I don't know if that's necessarily, I, I, so um, gap junctions definitely communicate astrocyte to astrocyte, but I don't necessarily know if that's the case. In other words, I don't know if astrocytes need to be touching each other to elaborate that, that, that mechanism of toxicity. That's right. Oh, sorry. On your, on your first part uh, of your talk, 
you mentioned uh, that you were able to detect this protein in the CSF and that it may be a biomarker. Can you elaborate on that? Is this like an early detection marker, pharmacokinetic biomarker? What kind of biomarker it is? And then uh, do you detect it only in CSF? Can it be present also in serum or plasma? Great question. Um, so to, I'll start with the last part of the question. Can we detect it in serum or plasma? So we haven't looked, and I'll tell you why because these connexin proteins are not unique to um, astrocytes. They're in, particularly enriched in astrocytes, but they're also present in cardiac muscle. So there are people interested in modulating um, electrophysiological activity in, in the heart. So my suspicion uh, is that connexins from muscle would probably contaminate any ALS specific effects. Um, we don't have enough samples to be able to look longitudinally your point about um, could this be a prognostic uh, marker and so forth? We don't have enough samples to be able to say that. What I can tell you, in the samples we used, just ALS or control, we were able to detect the difference. But we couldn't, didn't have enough um, either time points or samples to be able to talk about do patients with more disability have higher levels and so forth, right? Great question. So you showed that uh, connexin was increased, right, in, in different models and in the patients. Do you know... Why? And is it at the RNA level, protein level? Is it like when the astrocytes are activated that it's part of a transcriptional change? Or? Yeah, that's a great question. The question is why is why are these why are these connexin 43 proteins um, upregulated? Uh, they are activated, but probably separately from just as we think about, let's say, GFAP um, upregulation. So we've been able to show um, that those those two phenomena are probably separate, but it probably is uh, as an activated astrocyte. The mechanisms and the specific pathways by, by which that occur, you know, we don't necessarily have a good idea. Can, can you activate them in astrocytes? Like in culture, if you have cultured astrocytes, can you stimulate them and, and see an increase? Yeah, so, the, so um, other groups who've looked at connexin biology or even gap junction biology will activate them via a number of different pathways. So. Um, a lot of chemokines and cytokines will subsequently activate and upregulate those. And actually those uh, chemokines and cytokines actually also alter the opening of the, of the channel as well. And so we're very interested in, um, like I say, what, what, opens those, what opens those channels. We've got some ideas along those lines. Yeah. Hey, uh, really interesting talk. I thought you made a, like a really important point about the different ALS subtypes uh, and it kind of connecting that to the Connexin 43 uh, results. It seems like a handful of your patients really had sky high elevation, and then many were sort of overlapping with the healthy control. Could you tell us a bit more about those data points? Were they further along in the disease? Did they have a particular ALS subtype? That's a great question. I, I'd love to be able to tell you yes, that whether they, they were, but no, it was it was it was very much a mix. Um, it, it was a mix among. We looked at some bulbar. We looked at fast and slow. One thing I will tell you, I didn't show you the slide for the for the sake of time. Some of the highest levels were in the. We, we looked at patients. Um, looked at three patients with the A4V mutation, patients with a slower progressing D9DA mutation that controls, and there was in those A4V patients, which we consider very rapid. Uh, a higher level of connexin 43 expression. Again, it's a small number, but at least as far as, let's say, bulbar or spinal onset, no particular signal in that respect, right? I think that was a beautiful talk. Thank you. Um, you had shown the uh, co-culture system yeah. of your kind of C, um, cortical motor neurons and lower motor neurons. So how are you generating cortical motor neurons from iPS cells? And if you are, then Early days, but yes. So it turns out that a very talented assistant professor in my lab is an epileptologist, a pediatric epileptologist, um, with who's a card carrying stem cell biologist. So she's actually, we're actually using a technique. She didn't invent the technique, but she's been driving the cortical differentiation of those of those cell types. And so I think it's really um, interesting. I, Evangelist and I were talking um, yesterday, and Hyundai and I haven't had a chance to talk in detail, but. Yeah, very early days. Um, we have some, what we think might be good markers, at least for astrocytes, that we can get axons, we can separate these groups and we can get axons to grow through, but um, we've, we've got a little bit of ways to go. Yeah. If I may just ask, thank yeah. you. I'm just asking another question regarding the connection 43. Yeah. Have you looked at, at their um, processes on endovascular or so endothelial cells? Because there's maybe some evidence of blood-brain yep. barrier breakdown. I'm just wondering whether there's any connection between the astrocytes 
in your connection uh, connection um, channels with those? Uh, that's a great question. So the, the question was whether there, what's the relationship to blood brain barrier? Um, excellent point. That's not we have we haven't looked specifically. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways to do that microscopically and using some endothelial cell markers and so forth. We we haven't looked specifically. No. Uh, for the gabagiancin of collagen 14.3, do you think it's the hemi channel or the full or the complete channel? Do we think it's the hemi, do, as far as, do we think it's the hemi channel or the gap junction? Is that, is that Yes, yes. Yeah. So we believe the hemi channel mediates that, that um, we believe the hemi channel mediates the excitotoxicity. Okay, so you think that's the hemi channel. Uh, the other question is, uh, uh, do you think the uh, connecting 143 hemi channel uh, is responsible for, for the communication of the like the sort of one muting the protein or uh, or other <coughs> other related protein a signal protein to regulate the toxicity? So do I think that the connection 43 hemi channels is, is allowing the release of the SOD1 protein? Oh uh, yeah. All the uh, all the some signal protein to re to indirectly regulate the uh, toxicity. So could there be an indirect phenomenon? There could be. You know, it only allows. So the full length SOD1 protein is too big to go through the hemi channel. Could there be a fragment of that? There are actually people interested in. Again, that's a little bit above my pay grade, but some of these fragments of toxic forms of SOD1. <laughs> but I think they're all still too big to pass through the hemi channel. Um, so it really only allows up to 1.5 kD. Um, again, um, microRNAs would be a, a particular target of interest for us, but ions and so forth. Could that be something downstream? It's certainly possible. So the right. last question is, uh, uh, connecting 43 is the predominant um, connecting, pro uh, uh, connecting protein in the CNS. Uh, do we have other connecting um, Proteins that are that might be responsible. Yeah. And also, my question, this question is related to the uh, the blocker, uh, the the comp the blocker uh, tenebrous size. Is that just the specific for the connecting fourteen three, or just a broader uh, and broader blocker right. targeting also other like connecting twenty six, connecting thirteen two right. things? Thank yes. you. Yeah, my pleasure. So the question is, are there other connections in the central nervous system? And the answer is absolutely there are. In fact, there are connections associated with other CNS diseases. There are neuronal connections. There are oligodendroglial connection, uh, connections. So, uh, and then there are actually, uh, there's a literature that suggests you can get hetero, um, uh, heterodimers, essentially. You can get two different connections that talk to each other, connection, uh, connection 43 and connection 26, for example. So. The answer is yes, there are more than one type of connexin. Tenabrasat is probably specific to connexin 43 at the concentrations we've used at higher levels. It probably blocks the entire gap junction, so it gets a little bit nonspecific in that respect. Um, there is one report um, to suggest that some of these drugs might act on both connexin 43 and some of the microglial connexins as well. So probably is a dose dependent um, phenomenon. Um, so, Nick, I was really fascinated by the uh, effects of the connexin 43 inhibitor on neuronal excitability, yeah. where you showed that basically when you treat the cells. Do you know how that works? Do you, do you have a sense of what exactly mediates the effects on excitability? So we're st we have some ideas. One could be glutamate. So glutamate would be a natural. So we know glutamate is a gliotransmitter. It goes through these connexin 43 um, hemi channels. So that would be one possibility as an excitatory um, from the other one we think maybe playing a role is ATP. And so we're very interested in the threat of looking at ATP and purinergic receptor activation. And if I may, uh, there's a couple questions online. So, okay. so one question I came through is they, they wanna know whether the drug you used crosses the blood brain barrier is concentrated in the CSF um, because there's some thought that a Daravon tends to be concentrated in the CSF rather than cross the blood brain barrier. I imagine this refers to the connection 43 inhibitor, the, the, the migraine drug. Right, so we, um, the, uh, when those studies were done, I, I don't have access to the, when the drug was originally developed, I don't have access to those PK data, nor did they do CSF analyses because that wasn't part of their original study design. 
So we've not done, let's say, in mouse models to know its, its, um, how it's metabolized or its PK in the CSF. The fact that it acts on cortical spreading depression and aura could get a little bit of this vascular idea, but um, probably does. Uh, and again, I couldn't tell you the levels by which it accumulates in the CSF. Hi there. Um, I would just love your perspective on this. So as um, a patient advocate and someone who lost their father to ALS, with the new genes that are, you know, coming out and things like that, what is your perspective on the mitochondrial defect and patients and their families then concentrating on gut health, especially if there's like the controversy, I guess, behind family members that would like to do genetic testing and not. And so for the family members that feel like they still are looking for something that they can do, do you think that they should focus on improving gut health in a way of um, improving, you know, the brain to body and gut connection? So, so the question is, I think about the about the gut health and maybe the gut microbiome. I'm guessing. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so I think that I again not my focused essay, but I think the microbiome is really interesting. Um, I think the data in many ways are quite compelling, even from some of the animal models with regard to the, but what I don't know is what's the right recipe, I guess, um, as far as how, you know, what gut health means and is there, so I tell patients very practically from the standpoint of genetics analyses that you should absolutely talk to a genetic counselor if you are not symptomatic, that's part one. Um, and part two, with regard, I tell patients I, I don't have any, um, I don't have any bias with regard to specific diets or specific things that I think make the gut microbiome better or healthier. Um, it's just a little bit out of my wheelhouse. But I, I've not seen data that that would suggest that one particular strategy is better than the other. I, I do think e eating healthier and eating better is probably good for all of us. But we do know through some good data to suggest the patients who maintain their weight. Right, probably do better with the disease. But for pre patients who aren't symptomatic, I think it's a little trickier. Does that, does that answer your question? Does. Thank you. So there's another interesting question for you online, asking whether, um, whether you can make a comment about the potential association between um, recurrent concussions mm -hmm. and ALS, um, given the, this recent um, you know, study that was published showing that there's a potential interest, I guess. What, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, so I'm not an epidemiologist, but I, uh, I, the issue about concussions and ALS goes back a long time. And I've seen both literature to suggest that there's potentially a role and others to suggest there is no role. Although all that said, it may be in many cases, there's a, a genetic susceptibility. And I think, you know, the, the idea about could individuals harbor some kind of susceptibility gene that may make them more likely to get um, disease following, whether it be a traumatic injury or some kind of environmental injury, um, is certainly an interesting question. I think till we get better understanding of genetics and, and, and biomarkers, it's really hard, especially in the case of traumatic injury, because you know, sometimes there's recall bias and what happened at 10 years of age may not, right? So as compared to what happened last year, maybe a little bit trickier. So. Um, I, I've seen evidence on both sides. I think that these are interesting questions. And if, if it is the case that there's more likely than not some kind of um, susceptibility gene. Yeah. Great, are there any other questions? Well, if not, then that's all. Thanks. Thanks.